didn't know what to bring to you today. But as usual, the Holy Spirit never fails. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a message. It's, it's from my heart. When I woke up this morning, I opened my emails, as probably many of you do. And there's an email there that says this. Five revivals are happening in America currently. I'm always reserved when I read something like that. And so I read about each one of these so-called revivals. This is not to knock anyone what I'm saying, but there is such a misunderstanding about what revival is in the world. Um, each of these were five different movements of churches in the U.S. and I looked at what they were calling revival, and it's not what the Bible would call revival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, right, first of all, I just want to clarify this, because the word revival has been banded around for so long, mm -hmm. loosely, not only in America, but here, even in this city here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's a shame and it's a disgrace on the kingdom of God, because when God has revival, which I don't even believe that word is in the Bible, but... When God brings revival, what he's doing is bringing something back from the near death Amen. and bringing life to it. Mm. Revival's got nothing at all to do with miracles and healing, although it can, that can be a side benefit of it. Mm. Four of these so-called revivals were all about healing and miracles. As soon as I read that, I thought, these people don't understand what biblical revival is, godly revival is. This is not... God is not so interested in your healing as he is in your spiritual healing. Yes, sir. So the, the physical healing is only a spin-off. And it worries me when the church, especially the Pentecostal church, is teaching its people what they perceive to be revival, and it's not revival. And when revival is judged as people getting healed or even salvation, revival is not about salvation. Mm. Revival is not about healing or miracles because... It, Salvation is, 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 you can't bring back from near death something that's already dead. Mm. Salvation is about hearing the gospel and accepting the gospel. That's what, that's what salvation is. That is not what revival is. Revival, we see it, we see it, and I'll bring some scriptures this morning, what true revival is, and it's bringing life back into something that is almost dead. Mm. That's what true revival is. So these can, all these things like healing and miracles and, and whatever, that can be the spillover effect of a vi revival. But true, of a, true revival is when the believer's hearts are turned back mm. to God through a deep knowledge of their fallen state. Here lies the problem why churches are calling it revival, because they don't realize they're in a fallen state. That's the big problem we've got in the world. So they're not judging revival correctly. They're judging it on the merit of miracles and, and even salvation when that has really little to do with true revival. Are you with me so far? Yeah. So there's never been a spiritual awakening that did not begin in united prayer. Never in the history of the world. Every spiritual awakening, and I, I'd rather use that word than revival, comes out of united prayer. And usually it's a small group, smaller than this, of people that come together and are just sick and tired and sick and tired of what's happening and say, God, there's more. There's more. I know there's more. And they lay their life down for this. So what the church needs today is not better tools or machinery or buildings, not better preaching, but better people. Better people. And I'm going to say some fairly hard things today. Some people won't like it, maybe. Um, people that the Holy Ghost can flow through. People that the Holy Ghost... Charles Finney says this, and I've studied quite a lot of the revivalists over the years. He said, the key that unlocked the heavens in the great revival of the 1700s that he was involved in was the prayers of a man called Father Nash. Now, most people haven't heard of Father Nash. But you've all heard of Charles Finney, right? Mm -hmm. yes. But Charles Finney said that without Father Nash, he had nothing. Father Nash went ahead of Finney wherever Finney was to go. Nash was the key figure in the greatest revival, possibly, that the earth has seen in many, many centuries. 
Nobody knew of Father Nash. Father Nash was not a Catholic. He was, they just called him Father Nash because he was an old man. And his ministry, he had been called as an intercessor to pray. And he understood the value of the intercessor. And so what would happen within three months of uh, Finney going into an area, he would send a Nash into that area on his own. Imagine that. Say, Brother Mike, can you go into Turangi or can you go to Taupo on your own? And you spend two or three months praying there. And you prepare the way before I come in. And you would go to say Taupo and you would find two or three people in the established church that were sincere about God and truly committed to seeing a breakthrough. And you would bring them together, go to a boarding house and you would hang out there for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. No food, nothing. Just prayer. And this is what this is what Nash would do. And within three months of Nash dying, Finney stopped. His calling to the ministry. Finney said, I no longer can operate in the ministry. Father Nash has died. That's how dependent Finney was on this prayer. A man that had sold his life out. And there's some keys. I'm bringing some keys, so please hear these. A man that had sold his life out to true revival. He never preached. Nash never preached. He never taught. All he did was go in and pray. Most people never heard of him or never ever saw him. He'd go in like a stranger into a town or a city and he'd leave there. Often before Finney even had finished his meetings. It's recorded of a woman who owned a boarding house where Nash stayed. And she said, she actually called Finney and she said, Mr. Finney, I believe there's one of your people are here. He's been here for five days already. There's three others with him. She said, I'm the owner of such and such a boarding house. They, bought, they rented a room off me. I'm deeply concerned I haven't seen them for five days. Finney said, don't worry. I know what they'll be doing. Of course, she, she worried. And she got a key and went to the door, opened the door. And here were these men prostrate on the floor crying out to God. They were sincere. They were, they, they, were, they, were, they were groaning in anguish for true revival and for the souls of that town. Wow. <clears throat> oh, that there would be someone like God said, I search for a man to close the gap but I could find none mm. in Ezekiel. The key to any success in ministry any success in revival is someone that is willing to sell their life out to intercession. True intercession. That's the key. If any one of us are ever going to succeed in the ministry, and when I talk about success, I'm talking about in God's eyes, we need not to do it on ourselves, but we need the backing of intercessors. Mm. Intercessors. Mm. To know our individual calling is what's <clears throat> needed in most believers' life. It, I would think it would be true to say most believers don't even know what their calling is. Many are called to this type of ministry that Nash was called to. I know that. I believe that with all my heart. But very few have accepted the call. Why? Because we haven't placed an emphasis in the church on this type of prayer. We haven't said, are you willing to give up your all, your job, you're all to go and lay on your face mm -hmm. and seek God for this town until we get the breakthrough. Finney would never, ever preach, he says, until the breakthrough had already happened. He had the easy job. Of course, we've all heard about this great preacher that, that multitudes come to Christ. In. The churches were turned upside down. The bottle stores were closed. Same as the Welsh Revival. The jails were closed. But it really had little to do with Finney. He was just the oracle. It had everything to do with Father Nash. What This inspired me this week as I searched the Lord because I said, Lord, I know there is more. I know there's more for you and me. Mm. I'm talking about it. I know there's more. We just get so complacent and say, oh, well, that's the way it is. And we go through life on this, this doldrum of... of treadmill life, just going through the same routines, motions, day after day. But there is more. I know there's more. And I know that God doesn't need a multitude of people to change this nation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
God needs someone that's willing to sell their soul to intercede. He, there's plenty of preachers around. There's plenty of evangelists that are taking more than they should be taking. There's not more evangelists we need. There's not more pastors we need. We've got too many now. What we need is a culling of the pastors, a sitting out. What we need is people that are sold out to prayer, willing to give up their all for prayer. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I'm sure talking to myself. Mm. Ezekiel said, the Spirit of the Lord set me in a valley. He said it was full of dry bones. He led me back and forth, the scripture says, among them, and I saw a great many bones, Ezekiel said, on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. We all know what this is talking about. This is talking about the church. This is talking about people. Bones that are dry. There's no life left in it. The very life had been sucked out of these bones. And God then cries out to Ezekiel and he said, Can these bones live? And Ezekiel is hesitant to answer God because even he's not sure. He's looking in the natural, like our sister's talking about, don't face, don't look on the natural, get up into the spiritual. Ezekiel is caught up in the spirit, but he keeps falling back into the natural and he's looking at it and going, I don't know if this can happen, God. This is just too big a ass. The church is in too big a mess. God is looking for a man to speak to the bones like he told Ezekiel. Speak to them. Declare to these bones. Declare to these communities. Declare to these nations. Declare to those families that are backslidden and gone backwards. We can't do this on our own. Our brother Bruce has seen great success in the last six months. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm arrogant enough, if you like, to tell you it's not because of him. It's because of the prayer of the saints that are backing him and have backed him even before my mother passed away and, and other people that have prepared the path. Mm. We have to understand that nothing to do with us. It's not about how good I can speak or you can speak. We've got nothing to do with us. This is about God. This is about Amen. God that brings revival. It's not about me or you. It's not about how good a teacher we are. It's not what we know. It's Amen. him. Amen. Amen. We have to catch that. So we need people that are willing to lay on their face and cry out to them. Not for 30 minutes a day. I believe personally, this is my personal belief, if you're not tithing 10% of your time now, in your day, you're robbing God. Forget about the money side of it. Mm. Tithing is more than money. Tithing is giving of yourself. I can tell you, and I don't say this out of pride, if I don't give God eight, eight hours of my day, I am weeping before God by the night time. And that's the truth. And you say, it's all very well for you and not working. Well, I am now as well. I'm still doing it. Mm. You might not like what I'm saying. But what's more important to you and me? We've been gathering now for two and a half years. I want to see a breakthrough. Amen. Amen. I want to see a breakthrough. I want to walk into a room or when someone walks in a the room, they feel so convicted by the presence of God that's upon me that they fall to the floor and say, what is it you've got? I want it. Mm. That's what I want. I am desperate. For, I'm tired of playing church. In Genesis 26, verse 18, Then Isaac dug again the wells. This was the scripture I was going to bring. The Lord gave me, so I'll share it anyway. Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Father Abraham. Of course, Abraham's dead by now. The worlds have been covered over for some time. Abraham's legacy is far gone. It's no longer any good because his enemies have filled in the worlds. And Isaac hears from God and he gets out a shovel and he starts digging. And Isaac unblocks the worlds that had been filled in. That's the calling for you and me today. It's time to unblock. The wells. The wells in the church that have been blocked for so long. Isaac accepted the responsibility to revive that which would bring life again. And he did it. To revive anything means to bring it back the way it's meant to be. Moses understood the price. Moses understood the price. One must pay to lay down his fleshly life. Moses thought he had it together. He's a prince. He's well educated. He's got lots of money. In the natural, Moses would have a great church. 
because he's got all the means to be able to do whatever he wants to do and draw a crowd. He's got the position, he's got the power, he's got the prestige, the money. And he tries to embark on ministry that way. And we know what happens. He gets in the flesh. For 40 years, God has to work on him because Moses is so hard-headed. 40 years has to be knocked out of Moses before God can use him. But Moses knew the price that had to be paid after that 40 years. How could he bring revival to Israel if he hadn't had revival himself? How do we bring revival in the church when God hasn't revived me? Huh? In the natural, Moses had everything going for him. In the supernatural, he was as dead as the ones that he was meant to bring revival to. It's hard to think of this great man, Moses. Moses was spiritually dead until God got hold. John Baptist knew more than anyone the price to pay. Jesus said there was never a greater man, never a greater prophet than John up until that time. He knew the price he had to pay to usher in the Messiah. The Bible says, and it's the only record that I know of in the Bible, where when a child is born, he's been filled with the Holy Spirit at birth. Can you imagine that? Mm. Not even Jesus is recorded in the Bible. John the Baptist it was recorded that when his mother conceived, she conceived not only the seed of John the Baptist, but the Holy Spirit at the same time. I don't know how that works out. But John was conceived with the Holy Spirit. So he knew his calling. And like Moses' years in the wilderness, we've all been there. John has prepared himself for what? He was called to do. Isaiah the prophet is another one. Declaring through the corridor of time. He says prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's the foundation scripture that we come together on. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the way. Make the paths straight again that are crooked. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain shall be brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight. The prophet said. And the rough way smooth. And all flesh. Not some, all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. What's he talking about? What a mission this guy John had. What a mission this, he's talking about John the Baptist, of course. What a mission John had ahead of him. John's job was to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. That's your job, my job. I don't know if you know that. Never in history, other than at the first coming of Christ, has there been such an important task placed upon the ecclesia, the church. Amen. Never in history. And that is to prepare the way of the Lord, to make the crooked path straight. Mm. Isaiah is, is reflecting in this prophecy given by the Lord about John the Baptist. He's reflecting in that time of what would happen when a king would come to the city or the town. The servants would go out before the king come and they would clean the roads. They would fill in the potholes. They would take out any bushes in the way, any molehill that make it plain. Why? Because when the king come in in his chariots, the path had to be smooth so the king could come into the city. And that's what Isaiah is speaking of. That's our job. That's your job. That's my job. Mm. Look, we've been put on this earth for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. I know I'm not just speaking to myself. When I preach, I preach to myself, so don't take offense. I'm preaching to myself, but we've been put on an hour such as this for a reason. And never had there been a greater prophet than John the Baptist, according to Jesus. And the reason that he was gay, great was because he was ushering in the King of Kings. What are we meant to be doing? The same. Mm. The same. It's our job, the same as John. And the benefit we've got is we can look back on history so we don't make the same mistakes. So we, so we, we can do a better job than John by reflecting back on history. The church was not ready for him. I'm talking John. They certainly weren't ready for Jesus. John's job was to prepare the church. And we know he didn't pull any punches in doing it. We've become too PC in the church. Too passive. 
trying to be nice to everybody, trying to love everybody with a natural love. John didn't do that. He said, you filthy brood of vipers. He told the truth. I mean, we laugh and go, well, that was back then. Hey, the church is in a worse state today. We're talking about the church that Jesus Christ died for. He gave his life for. And the filth and the sin and, and the crud that's within the walls of the church have to be stripped out. That is the job of the intercessor. That is the job of the true teacher of the word of God today. That is the job of the prophet. The problem was they wouldn't let the prophets go into the church. Look at Jeremiah. 40 years. 40 years he can't even get in the door. They won't let him in the door. God has said, give them a word. This is straight from God's throne room. And they won't even allow Jeremiah in the building. Because his word would just cut through them. They didn't want to hear the truth. What a mission you and I have got. Mm. Yes. How will we prepare the way for the coming king? Each of us have got a different task. Not all of us have the same calling. You know, I'm different than you. My God, you don't want to be like me. <laughs> I probably don't want to be like you. Yeah. We've all got a different mission. Yeah. We've all got a different task. But we have a task. And it's to prepare the way for the coming king. It's not to bow down to secularism. It's not to bow down to the way the church wants to do things. It's to bow down to the king of kings. Mm -hmm. And prepare from the word of God the truth. Some believe John was Elijah who had come back from heaven because he functioned in so many ways like Elijah the Bible tells us. Revelation says there's two witnesses coming in this time soon. Those two witnesses, they may be individually, actually, the people, God may send them back. We don't know. I'm not going to get into that dispute. But I believe what it means is the spirit of these two witnesses is going to be upon the remnant. That's what I believe it is. That spirit of Elijah can be on you and me. Amen. Yes. God wants it upon you and me. Yes, he does. He wants the spirit of whomever the other one is, be it Moses or what. It'll be something to do with the law, the word of God. Someone who upholds the truth of the word of God. That spirit can be and should be upon each of us because how can we prepare the way if we don't have the spirit of Elijah upon us? Mm. Does it amaze you this? And this will just blow out the water of what I read this morning. Does it amaze you? John the Baptist never did one miracle and never healed one person. Mm. According to Jesus, he was the greatest of all. Mm. Mm -mm. Not one miracle. Mm. I like that. Not one healing. Not one. See, the emphasis is all wrong mm. in the church. It's on what God will do for you rather than what you will do for God. Mm. That's where the emphasis is wrong. When we look at the greats of the Bible like Moses, David, Abraham, Hannah, she was a great woman. There is an intercessor for you, Hannah. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, John himself. The, the, the greatness comes from a time of brokenness in the wilderness. Oh, people would love to throw stones at you and say, but I know that sister so-and-so did this or did that 10 years ago. Who cares? God doesn't remember it. Why should the church be throwing it in your face? Brother so-and-so, he did this or that. Who cares? God's forgotten it. What right does anyone have to start resurrecting the muck? But these great men and women of God, they spent time in the wilderness broken. They ministered unto the Lord and there lay the secret. Mm. That's the secret. It's not about knowledge. If there is only one thing you can do, throw your Bible in the bin and please hear what I'm saying. If, you, if you've only got one choice... Throw the Bible away, but minister unto the Lord. Mm. If it has to be study of the word of God or ministering unto the Lord, it's a clear choice. Mm. Minister unto the Lord. Minister unto the Lord. True revival only comes from brokenness and from that a deep agonizing for those that are lost. Please hear what I'm saying because I spend a lot of time in the word of God. I'm not <laughs> literally saying throw your Bible. I'm trying to prove a point here. When you say minister to the Lord, what do you mean? Pray. Yeah. Pray yeah. It's it's in prayer. It it's I, I'll come to it shortly. It how can I put it in clear? It's agonizing, mm -hmm. agonizing 
um, agonizing over, over the souls of people. That's what ministering to the Lord is. When you take his place, remember this. In Genesis, he gave man authority. He gave man a dominion. God can't, won't, sorry, do anything without you or me. He's put us here as his agents to do his work. Mm. We've got the backup that he's given us, which is angels, and that's awesome. But that's the reason you and I are here. So God is wanting us to do the work he has given to us. Right, so when we minister to him, what we're doing is, 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 is we're taking the place as if he was here himself trying to win the world like Jesus was. Hmm. We're taking that place. So we agonize over the loss, over the souls. And we bring it before the Lord. We stand in the gap for people. Jesus, before he died, he said, Father, forgive them. What's he doing? He's taking the place of those people that aren't doing what they should be doing themselves. That's what ministering to the Lord is. Mm. Only God can bring revival. Uh, you know, excuse me, just a little sidetrack. For me personally, there's only a personal thought. I don't believe that we can minister to the Lord until we're truly broken ourselves. Amen. We have to be broken. Mm. We have to come to that place where nothing is as important as the soul of your neighbor mm. or your family. Mm. Not your food, not your home, not your wife, not your children, not your husband. Nothing this is important. Why? Because God's not willing that any should perish. That's his heart. That's the purpose. We're, we're not here to be kept out of hell. That's not the reason God brought salvation through Jesus. That's not the purpose. The purpose is so we can minister to him. That's a side benefit. Yeah. This is the side benefit. So until we've actually, uh, until we carry this It's like a, a fire is the best word that doesn't go out. A passion where we see people, it breaks us. Where we see people that are caught in sin, where it breaks us. There's something deep inside where it brings tears to your eyes. That's the only way you can minister to God because then you're on the same level as he's thinking. I was troubled this week when I asked the Lord what what, what do you want me to bring? What, Because I, I can teach and preach on most things. I, it's, I, I don't want to do that. I want to bring what he's... So I'm sharing my heart today, and I guess it's not any a specific message as such as the heart of God that, that, that I'm carrying at the moment. Keep in mind, Jesus only had a, ever had a problem with one type of people, and that was the church. Is there any problem he had? He didn't mm. have a problem with the unbelievers. Mm. So, well, that's a bit harsh. No, it's true. Look at read your Bible. It's true. Jesus only had a problem with the church. He didn't have a problem with the unbeliever. So, what's changed? Nothing. The church desperately needs revival. Desperately needs reviving. True revival. When I speak of the church, I'm not referring to a denomination or even a group of people because we are the church, we are the ecclesia. A lot of those buildings should be shut down and the money given to people God is truly calling. A lot of churches, even the ones that have 10,000, some of them need to shut their doors and give their money away to someone that is really going to stir true revival in this end hour. To someone that is going to bring those people from dried bones back to flesh on their bones. That's what the church needs. And there's a lot of churches that should be closed that are causing great harm to the body of Christ because people think this is the way the church is meant to function. The prophet Malachi thunders these words, and I wrote this down yesterday. Oh, that you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires at my altar. This is God speaking. For I am not happy with you. Amen. This is God speaking. Oh, that you would shut the doors of your church. For I am not happy with you. Mm. 
Mm. See, we have to catch the heart of God. This is, we, we look, oh, he's a loving God. Now. Yeah, he is. But this is a loving God. He doesn't want to see this because it's hurting the unsaved. When the unsaved look at it, goes, that church, I don't want nothing to do with it. Revival is not from a community, not for a community, it's not for a city. And please understand what I'm saying here. It's for the church. Mm. Judgment must begin, the Bible says, in the house of God. You cannot revive that which is already dead. If you're not saved, you're already dead and you're trespassing sin, the Bible says. How can you revive something that's already dead? You can't. So revival isn't for the spiritually dead. Revival is for the church that is spiritually dry. That's what revival is for. There are men that God has raised up for the same time, great revival. And when I say men, I mean women also. But in particular, there are prophets that are raised up in this hour. And I just want to spend a little bit of time on this. The prophet has been delayed in his calling for some time in the church now. Some churches haven't allowed the prophet in the door. Like Jeremiah, now get out, we don't want to hear what you've got to say. <laughs> Some of our people might leave. We couldn't have that because how would we pay the mortgage? Jeremiah wasn't the only one that had to sit outside the door. Jesus was another one. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, <laughs> anyone, can you hear me? <laughs> so I heard someone say, why didn't Jesus just open the door? Because there's only one handle on it, it's on the inside. It's not on the outside. We have to open the door for him. That's why I said, if anyone here, I'll come in. That's the church of the South, by the way, the Laodicean church. The price, sorry, the, there are men that God has raised up, these prophets in this hour. And I just want to say this, because the Holy Spirit really impressed this on me. I didn't read this anywhere or get this from anyone. The prophets have been delayed. The true prophets, a lot of wish-washy prophets out there that are doing it for filthy lucre and God will judge them. Filthy what? Lucre, money. Oh. Charging for prophecy. Charging for this. I'm not talking about those rascals. I'm talking about the true prophets of God that God has got in this hour to shape the church. Those prophets have been held back for two reasons. One, because the church wouldn't open the doors to them. And number two, because the intercessors haven't gone ahead. Mm. It's an integral thing. We need intercessors that recognize their calling and commit to that calling. What's happened is there's been too many people want to preach and teach and say, I'm a pastor, I'm a teacher, when God didn't call them for either. Mm. Too many that said, oh, I'll be a missionary when God didn't call them to be a missionary at all. Maybe he called them to be an intercessor. The price to be that intercessor is going to cost everything and few are willing to pay the price. Why am I teaching this today? Because I hope it stirs your heart and I hope that you can stir other people's heart because there are many intercessors out there that are avoiding their calling simply because the church is not placed an emphasis and the great need in this out for it. And there are those who call themselves pastors who are delaying the prophet from bringing the word of the Lord to the people. See, the people in the buildings don't belong to any pastor. You don't belong to me. I don't even call myself a pastor. I wouldn't last five minutes in most churches. The people are owned by God. Mm. They're not owned by any pastor. What right has a pastor got to stop the word of the Lord coming to set them free? What right has he got? The people should drive him out with a whip. So well, it's pretty harsh. No, that's exactly what Jesus did. Mm. Exactly what Jesus did. How can the church come to maturity? How can it come to maturity? When the shepherds are preventing the sheep from maturing. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Ephesians said God placed in the church. Apostles, prophets, yeah. evangelists, pastors right down the bottom end of the thing. Why? Because you can't, a pastor can't do it on his own. God designed the church to be like that. You know that as well as I do. 
But people have been deceived into believing that. Forgive me for being so excited about this, but, but it, it's something that's been stirring in me for a long time. Jeremiah suffered this great agony. He had a message from God that the church needed to hear, but the church didn't want to let him in. Malachi wept over the condition of the church. The very shepherds who were meant to protect the sheep have imprisoned the sheep. This is a heavy message. But this is the heart of God. I know this is the heart of God. Whether you like it or not, this is the heart of God. God <coughs> is going to give these churches exactly what they ask for. Oh, he'll give them more money, more equipment, more people, flasher buildings. He'll turn them over to exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. But it's not what he wants. Mm -hmm. Prophets are God's emergency men for crisis times. God's emergency men for crisis times. They carry a message that's uncomfortable for the hearer. The hearer, ooh, it sounds harsh. That's what people think. Understand the difference between a prophet and a prophecy. I said this last week. Prophet, we all meant to prophesy, and that's great, and that's wonderful. A lot of it's got to do with too much pizza the night before. But, I mean, that's fine. And a lot of it's also just encouragement. The prophet has a word, a specific word. Amos 3, 7 said that God will do nothing in this earth mm. unless he first speaks to his prophets. The prophet has a word from heaven, what? To ignite the fire in the church because it's gone so dead and dry. Mm. It's a crime what's happened in our churches in our lifetime and before that, that the prophets have been kicked out of the church. Mm. Prophets stand alone. They are antagonized. There's an... The, the, that there's just something that twists inside of a prophet. Refusing to bow to the apostasy and to the clension that's within the church and also in society. Mm. A prophet does not accept what's going on. He'll get kicked out of church after church after church. People don't want to hear from the prophet because he cannot accept what's happening in the church. He cannot accept what's happening in society. God only raises prophets in times of declension. Have you ever thought about that? God only raises up prophets when things have declined so bad that he has to send a shot across the bow of the church. Mm. That's the purpose for the prophet. And usually the prophet is accepted only by a minority. Very few want to accept the word from the prophet. Elijah stands, in my opinion, as one of the greatest. I love this man, a little hairy man, the Bible calls him, a little hairy man. The amazing thing is, have you ever thought about this? I thought this way, Elijah is not mentioned in the Hebrews Hall of Fame. Mm. Of all those that are mentioned in the, Rahab the harlot, mm. I don't know what she did, other than give a bed to a few of the spies, but anyway, she's in there, and you've got Abraham, you've got a few others, but this great man of God gets no mention, like most prophets, in the Hall of Fame. I don't know why I'm going to ask God that one day. Why this? He was a great man. He was a heavyweight. When it comes to prophets, I don't think there's any heavier than Elijah. He preached to people as a dying man, to dying people. That was the call of Elijah's heart. Mm -hmm. There's no office higher than he who preaches the word of God, regardless of what you're calling us. There is no higher office than that. Because you are handling the word of God Almighty himself. What a mess we've made of this. What a mess the church has made of this. Compromising truth. Turning church into 60 minutes of entertainment. Having to look at the clock because system so-and-so wants to go home and put the roast on. We're so concerned the next meeting is going to start soon. We've got to shut this thing down. There is no room for the Holy Spirit to move even. Mm. It's just become a commercial business. You saw this morning. Did you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's only a few minutes in the presence of God. Imagine an hour or two of that. Mm. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer but you've turned it into a den of thieves. You know, I wrote this down. What has changed? 
nothing, nothing. What they were doing was trying to accommodate everyone's need. And I know this sounds harsh. You say, oh, it sounds really critical today, man. This is truth. We've got to come to a place of maturity where we accept the truth even if we don't like it. The church has become a commercial business in, in general, of religion. That's what it's become, a commercial business. What was it in Jesus' time? What was the first place Jesus went to when he rode into town? Church. What did he do? Turn the tables upside down. He went back the next morning to do that, I think. It was late in the day, he wanted to get home and have a rest. Goes back early in the next morning, gets his whip out, starts whipping everything in sight, turns the tables upside down, pushes out the commercialism. He's saying, you've turned my father's house into a commercial business. That's what he's saying. He said, but yeah, but they needed the animals to sacrifice. Yeah, no, no, no. Look, buy that outside at the market. Don't bring it into the church. My house has become a den of thieves. The ten lepers, I wrote this before I left this morning, <clears throat> only one of them come back to Jesus. Why? To worship him. Mm -hmm. To worship him. Only one of them out of ten. I thought about it, I thought, why? Why is it nine of them didn't come back? I know, I know the historically what they had to do if you're a leper, you had to go to the priest and get cleared and they give you a bill of clearance and all that. I know, I understand all that. But why didn't they come back and fall at his feet? Why didn't they realise? I believe it was this, I wrote this down. Because they saw Jesus through their eyes of their need. So many people get a miracle. Oh, they thank God. I oh, thank God, yeah, great miracle. My need has been met. But they miss the whole point mm. of what he's just done. Mm. It's not about the miracle. It's about drawing you back into a relationship that you have walked away from. That's the purpose of the miracle. I've seen so many miracles when I was on the mission field. And yet, I've followed up some of those people and I've seen that many of them are back in their wheelchairs or crippled within six months again. Many of them. Because they missed the whole point of the miracle. It's mm. not about you. It's not about you getting better. All as it is is to bring you back into a higher realm of understanding of God to bring you back into a relationship that you have either not in or you've walked away from. Did Jesus want to heal them? Of course he did. But the purpose was that there would be a constant reminder they could never forget this great miracle. They could never forget it. They could never forget that they were in need of a saviour because who else could do a miracle? That's the purpose of a miracle. But see, we've got so selfish in the church. We call it revival when people are getting miracles and we've missed the whole point. It's not about the miracle. Isaiah 66 verse 2 said, To this man I will look, I love the scripture, to him that has a broken and a contrite spirit, who trembles at my word. We talk, brother, this morning, what you asked, that's what it means to minister to God, where we tremble at the word of God so much. We declare the word of God over our families, over our, our relatives, over our Amen. nation, over our workplace. Where, where, where the word of God is so real to us, we can't but do that. We become prophets in a way that we're prophesying constantly to bring change wherever we are. One who trembles at the awesome task of representing a holy God. Think about it. The God who created everything. And we've been given, entrusted this task to represent him. Mm. 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 And we get so caught up in our doctrine, in our religious practice, that we forget what we're here for. Mm. The problem we've got in the church 
It's been sold a lie that the purpose of salvation is all about you and me. And it's not. Salvation is not about you as much as it is about him. The love of God brought salvation to each of our lives so we could minister to him and worship him. So we could have access into a place we never had access to. It's not even about heaven or hell. It's so we could come into that place that he created man for. To walk, to talk with him. To carry his heart, his the burden. That, you think God doesn't have burdens? I know we, we quote that scripture, Peter does cast the burdens. God carries a burden for the world, for the lost. Jesus carried it so much that he sweat great drops of blood, the Bible said. Imagine that. I haven't got to that place of you where you're interceding so hard that you start to bleed. They said this guy that, that was Finney's intercessor, often... Often, blood would come flowing out of his mouth or nose in intercession. Not because he was a sick man, because of the anguish that he carried for the people. That's the heart of God. Oh, boy, we've got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they might know thee. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what salvation's all about. It's not about heaven and hell. This is eternal life. That they might know you, God, the only true God. Healing miracles, salvation from sin is all for the purpose that we might know him. All of those things. And yet the church has centered on, on, on what we can get from God. If you're sick, come to, come to such and such a church because they've got an anointing, that healing. Well, so what? Who cares? Who cares? I'm sorry to sound so rude, but it, it, I mean, who can, it's more important that we have a heart for God and a hunger for God. And when we see sin, it breaks us and brings tears to our eyes. That's what's more important. This is eternal life, that we might know thee. Jesus never preached until he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist never preached until he's anointed by the Holy Spirit. What we do, we send men. Moses never preached until he's anointed by the Holy Spirit. I mean, yet we're sending men to seminary or Bible school. I've been there myself to get knowledge. But it's not about knowledge. It's about an anointing. Because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke, the Bible says. It's not the knowledge that will break the yoke. It's the anointing that will break the yoke. So without having that relationship with him, that intimacy with him, we don't have that anointing. None of these three ever received their credentials at any Bible seminary. No, none of them did. None of them attended any Bible seminary. They all attended the school, the Bible seminary of the wilderness. Mm. Where we become broken. Broken. Broken to the point, even Jesus Christ, to the point of death. That his flesh could no longer have any way in him. There is only one ordination required by God for you and for me. It's spelled out in John chapter 15, verse 16. that says this, I have ordained you that you may go forth and bear much fruit. That's the ordination you and I need and have been given. I've ordained you. It's Jesus saying that. <laughs> you don't get a better ordination than that. Mm. No certificate from Harvard or anything is going to give you that. I have ordained you that you may go forth and bear much fruit. No piece of paper is going to give you that. Mm -hmm. The evidence for that is going to be seen by all at the great white throne. It might not be seen on this earth, but it's going to be seen at the great white throne. It was George Whitfield, that great revivalist, he, the founder of the, the Methodist movement. It said that if George Whitfield was teaching on heaven, That as soon as he gave his text, people would feel like they're living in heaven. People would feel like they're in heaven. As soon as he opens his mouth and starts talking about heaven, you would feel like you're in heaven. But they said, look out, if you were there the night, he's preaching on hell. <laughs> because you'd feel like you're in hell. And it wouldn't leave you for days afterwards. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. 
That's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Very interesting about this man, Whitfield. Because seldom did he give altar calls. <coughs> seldom did he give altar calls. The power of God was so real that people would run to the altar while he's preaching. The presence of God was so strong and wherever he ministered that people felt the conviction. Of it. There was no need to give an altar call because the wooing of the Holy Spirit was so strong, so powerful like a man. People would run to the altar and he would just ignore them while they're weeping on the altar. Just leave them. Nobody went out of the prayer team or come and pray. No, there was none of that. Just leave them. Even if he walked out of the building, they still just leave them. Didn't matter. Finney didn't give altar calls. For 40 days, usually. He'd gone down there and preach for a month or a bit longer. Wouldn't give an altar call. Not once. Why? It's not the way we do it in church these days. Anybody here want to receive Christ? No, Finney wouldn't do that. He said if the, if, if the intercessor had done his job, the presence of God had already wooed and called the people that were going to run to the altar. He didn't even have to mention it. <laughs> That's the God we serve. The conviction of the Holy Ghost was so strong, no enticement was ever needed. I'm saying this for a reason because I'm trying to stir in you the hunger that's in me. I'm trying to stir that in you as well to know what sort of God we're serving. We don't have to do anything except obey Him. If there was no conviction, he believed the intercessor had not done their job. The prophet Leonard Raven, I love what he said. He said, he'd finish his message and the worship team would get up there to worship. He'd say, there'll be no worship. I don't want you to sing. And he would give, if you want to get your hearts right with God, I'm walking away from here. That's between you and God. And he'd tell the worship team, no singing, no worship. The reason he said that was because he said music often stirs a person's soul emotionally. Mm -hmm. And decisions get made out of emotion rather than out of a heart conviction. Mm -hmm. Why should people tremble at the word of God when the one who's bringing it doesn't tremble himself? Mm -hmm. Why should people weep before the altar when the one who's bringing the word is not weeping before the altar themselves. Mary Magdalene, I'm sorry if this is going a bit long, but I've got to give, because the Holy Spirit's given me, Mary Magdalene washed Jesus' feet, the Bible said, with her hair and her tears. That's a lot of tears. Mm -hmm. When you wash somebody's feet with your tears, you're crying a lot. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. She knew what she'd been forgiven from. A little bit of a history. Once a prostitute, Mary Magdalene, she's been dragged, but it's the same Mary that gets dragged before the, the Jesus by the Sanhedrin. This is the same Mary, by the way. Naked, throwing at Jesus' feet, said, we found this woman doing whatever. It's the same Mary Magdalene. Same woman. Can you imagine laying there in front of the Messiah, mm. naked, You've been caught in the darkest of sins. In front of all these people. Oh, Mary knew what she had been saved from. Huh? Later on, she'll give the disciples a hard lesson in what it means to be forgiven. When she pulls out that jar of perfume worth a, a year's wages. I was trying to work out how much that would be, brother Mike. But I guess it depends on who it was. I mean, some people are earning $100,000, $200,000 a year or more these days. Wow. Can you imagine a bottle of perfume? And she cracked that baby open and she poured it over Jesus' head and over his feet. Why? Mm -hmm. She knew what she'd been forgiven from. God had chosen this once prostitute to anoint the Son of God. Mm. That's what it was about. Mm. She knew what she was forgiven from. What an amazing sight. Mm. I thought about it this week. To see this woman who once was a high 
class prostitute come from the city of Magdalene where the Roman soldiers would go for their vacations to enjoy the woman and the alcohol. And Mary would go home periodically to her brother and sister, who was Martha. Remember Martha, the story of Martha and Lazarus? This is the same woman. She lived in the same house when she was at home. But when she was in Magdalene, her name is not Magdalene. Magdalene is the city she worked in. It was known as the Vegas of that area. And Mary would go there and do her trade and come back and see her brother and sister who were said to be very wealthy. They must have been to keep Jesus whenever he went to town. Mm. This is the same woman. What makes this woman so special is she had been so broken. She knew what she had been broken from. And so she understood forgiveness. This is the same woman that I believe was the closest of all the disciples. I think I can prove that biblically. The closest of all disciples. Well, closer than John, who was called the Beloved. This is the same woman that stood at the tomb. This is the same woman that stood at the feet of the cross with the mother of Jesus. This is the same woman that ran out and said, Master, my brother is dead. And she fell at his feet. She'd been broken. She had no reputation, just like most of us here, except that of a broken sinner. And the prophet Joel, he gives the condition of revival. See, Mary had had revival in her own life. But the prophet Joel gives the condition to the pastors of the day. He says, weep before the altars. Mm. What did he mean? If you don't know how to weep before God, it shows how immature spiritually you are. If you don't feel the pain that Jesus felt, it shows you've got a long way to go. If a pastor or a teacher doesn't know how to weep before God for those that God has entrusted them to bring his word to, they've got a long way to go. And they should get out of the pulpit. I heard this recently in American pastor, a very well-known pastor, say that sin is no longer a problem. And what they teach in their Bible school of nearly 2,000 students is exactly that. Sin is no longer a problem. He says, um, God is interested in you and what he can do for you. And their whole ministry is focused on miracles and healing. But this is probably the biggest Pentecostal ministry I know of in America. I won't mention any names. But sin is no longer a problem, he says. Can you imagine teaching 2,000 potential pastors that sin is no longer a problem? Hard from fear of hell. Straight out of hell. But that's what they're teaching. And these are men that have been to this nation and are idolized by the Pentecostal church worldwide. See, that's not what the church needs to be taught. We all know Jesus died for us and understand that, but sin is still a problem, mm. a very big problem. Ezekiel 44 says this. He says, The Lord said only that the sons of Zadok were worthy to minister to him. Now, I've got time to teach on that, and some of you already know about the Zadok priesthood, but only the Zadok priesthood were worthy to minister to God. The rest of the Levite priests, he said, I don't want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. You can carry on doing the weddings and go through the rituals, but I don't want to hear from you because I'm not going to listen to you. Only the Zadok priests had been set aside to minister to God. Here's the question, are you one of them? When the church at that time went their own way and they, they followed after Absalom, if you remember the story, and David gets run out of town and his very own son wants to kill him. Absalom, by the way, the meaning of the word Absalom, um, my father is peace. That's what that word means. My father is peace. Who was his father? David. 
Isn't God clever how he gave a name that people should have taken notice of mm -hmm. rather than try and run him out of town and kill him? My father is peace. Can you see the wisdom of God in that? But they didn't listen. The rest of the priests were no longer able to minister to God. What's the purpose of this life if we can't minister to God? More importantly, what's the purpose of life if God's not going to hear us? That's even more scary. Think about it. Because mm. there's a lot of people ministering to God, but God's not hearing them. Mm. Mm. The spirit of Absalom is one of false peace. In the church, a lot of it decided to run after Absalom. And it led them down a path that much of the church are going to be led down in this hour. In the time of Elijah, the church had sunk into such depravity, no longer her former glory. In 1 Kings 16, we see King Ahab doing everything that he should not do. And we know about Ahab. Ahab's rebuilding Jericho. God has said, don't rebuild it. Even at the expense of his son, it cost him his son's life. It didn't matter to Ahab. He builds a temple, an altar to Baal. We know that the Bible says Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord more than any. One translation said more than all of the kings before him. So the Bible says Ahab did evil in the sight of him. So God raises up this man called Elijah. I'm going to wrap it up in a few minutes. This little hairy man to take on this king. This little hairy man that can cause a nation to tremble. Why? Because it's not about Elijah, it's about the God that he serves. He's intimate with this God. And the secret of his life was this, he was obedient. That was the secret of, of Elijah's life. We can see that because so when God says to him, Elijah, you better go and hide yourself, he goes. He goes, runs to the book. And God says, you better appear again, he appears. Elijah He's not caught with the comforts of the ravens feeding him. When God says time to move, it's time to move. See, Elijah had no understanding of him except God. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me this week. You do it what you like. Great men, great men walk alone. Great women walk alone also. Great men or great women walk alone. Hmm. Think about all the prophets. Hmm. Think about even Moses, even his own sister wasn't happy with him. Great men, great women walk alone. What about Enoch? The Bible says Enoch walked with God. Huh? These men and God were sufficient. God in you is sufficient. You don't need me, I don't need you, but I need God. That's sufficient. Why? Because they heard the voice of God, the Bible says. You keep reading. You keep reading the same, right throughout the old covenant. The word of the Lord came unto me. You've read that hundreds of times probably. The word of the Lord came unto me. Mm -hmm. What did Elijah mean when he said it? The word of the Lord has come unto me. Did he hear a voice? I don't believe so. I don't believe he heard a verbal voice. What, what I believe is Elijah knew God's word. It's the prompting of the Holy Ghost when the Holy Ghost speaks to you a word in season. That's what Elijah's talking about here. The word of the Lord has come to me. Mm. He's feeling the anguish of God for his people. You think God doesn't have anguish today? I think he's got more anguish now than he's ever had. Mm. He's feeling the anguish. God is feeling for his people that have turned away from him. God is wanting men that feel the anguish that sin causes. If we don't feel that, if you thought about it, if we don't feel the pain that God feels with sin, when I talk about pain, this, this twisting inside, this anguish, this, this heartbeat, this heartache that just aches for what he is seeing. I'm talking about a feeling here. If, if we don't feel that, then we haven't arrived at a place where we're going to be effective for it. Mm. The Apostle Paul prayed in Philippians 3, verse 10, that I might know him. Yeah. This is a beautiful verse. 
that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. What does it mean? What does it mean, the fellowship of his sufferings? The fellowship is, is something when friends uh, are sharing in union, union this common interest. What is the common interest here? Christ's sufferings. Paul is saying, I want to feel, I want to know, I want to live what Christ lived. I want to carry that inside of me so it stirs my heart every moment of the day. The common interest is Christ's suffering. Why should Paul say this? Do you think Paul didn't have enough suffering? How many times the Bible said he shipwrecked? How many times beaten? 39 stripes, was it so many times? How many times did Paul go through incredible suffering that none of us have had anything like? Mm. And yet he said, I want to know the sufferings of Christ. You think Paul didn't have as much suffering in the natural as Jesus? I think he actually had more. Well, that sounds a bit sacrilegious. I think he had more. Because what we do is we, we focus on the cross. See, we focus on the terrible things. that It was horrible. We know that. But Paul had this suffering going on for years and years and years. In prison, beaten, whipped to the point of death. How many times? You think he didn't know what it was to suffer? He's not even talking about natural suffering. That's why. See, we need to teach the church. It's not about natural suffering. It's talking about spiritual suffering. It's, it's when something inside of you overrides your mind where you feel an anguish and a pain for what's happening in the church of the living God. Mm. And you can't shake it off. Mm. The Bible says Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane sweat great drops of blood. What was he sweating great drops of blood about? I know if we can surmise, I've got my own belief. I don't think it was about because he's going to the cross. I don't think it was about that. I don't believe that. I think it was because he's going to leave this world. And he's carrying the, the sins of the world, the pain of the world inside of him. The anguish he's carrying it. Can you imagine being in that condition that he was in? Paul knew what suffering was. Jesus Christ agonized over his church. And this was the great suffering of Christ that Paul wanted to be a partaker of. He suffered and agonized over the backslidden state of his church. You've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. Number two, Christ agonized over those who he loved so much. And yet they doubted his words and rejected him. Mm. Oh, the agony of that is worse than any whipping. Because you know where they're going. Number three, Christ agonized over those he was going to leave behind. Imagine if it's your mother. Jesus went to beloved John and he said, John, look after my mother. Why didn't the brothers of Jesus look after the mother of Mary? Obviously Jesus felt John was to be more trusted. And he says, look after my mother. You, can you imagine? You know you're going to die. Not because you're sick. But because you have placed your heavenly father even before your mother. And he gave his mother over to John. He said, look after my mother. Just think about some of these things. Mm. The pain, the ag agony that must have caused. The suffering. Oh, he loved his mother. It's one thing the Catholic Church has got right. Elijah is carrying the burden of the nation and he re recalls in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 13. Maybe this is your homework for the week. Verse 13, <coughs> go to verse 19. And, and it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commands, which I command you today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain and your new wine and your oil. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock, that you may eat and be filled. Notice the condition was the first verse. 
Take heed to yourself, lest your heart be deceived. Here's the warning. And you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain in the land, yield no produce. And you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord has given you. Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your hearts, your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets before your eyes, whatever frontlets is. Now, I just want to throw this in here. How is it that this amazing prophet of God could declare these words to the king? There's going to be no more rain for how many years? You ever thought about how oh, it's God? I want to show you how Elijah did this. Of course it's God, because it's God's word. Mm. But Elijah knew the Bible, and you've just read it. When Elijah saw what Israel had done, it broke his heart. And he carried the burden, the heart of God. And then he declared the word of God. That's all he did. Amen. That's all he did. He declared the word of God. And the rain stopped. God had to obey his word. That's right. Had to. It wasn't because God's going, zap, you're all zap. No, this was because a man of God took God's word literally. Mm. And he had a pure heart and he declared it and the rain stopped. Imagine when the rain stops. We saw a drought. We lost our cows. We lost our stock because of the rain recently. It's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Can you imagine for how many years losing everything, the food source, the lot? But this is a man of God that knows his God and he shall do great exploits. Daniel 11 says that the people that know their God, there mm. it is, we just read it, shall do great exploits. Mm. Yeah. And here we see this showdown with Elijah on Mount Carmel. And you've got the prophets of Baal. In other words, you've got the pastors of the day. And you've got one man, Elijah and God. And I'm going to leave you with this. I said that was your homework. This is your homework. I'm going to leave you with something. Because we've been preaching, talking about the altars of God. I'll read to you in closing. First Kings 17. We see the showdown. Verse 30 it says, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here. Come near to me. Have a look at this. That's what he's saying. And all the people, the Bible says, came near to him. And then he said, watch this. And he repaired the altar of the Lord. Elijah repaired, before any miracle happened, before the power of God fell, Elijah repairs the altar that has been damaged. And Elijah is saying, if you and I want the power of God, this is what he was saying to Israel, come and have a look. This is what the problem is. The altars being broken. The hearts are damaged. What is the altar? It's our hearts. Miracles are being withheld in our churches because the hearts are not as God required. The altar is not as God required it to be. There's a lot of altars that need rebuilding. There's a lot of hearts that need rebuilding. There's a lot of hearts that need breaking. Because mm. the Bible said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. That means we need a broken heart. Because until we get a broken heart, we can't be humble. Mm. Good Moses. See, there are two words the church doesn't speak much about today. One is repentance, and the other is restitution. Restitution. Restitution is the restoration of something lost or something stolen. Back to its rightful owner. Who is the owner of my heart? God. Who is the owner of your heart? God. Huh? Elijah had the anointing because he heard the word of the Lord to repair the altar. There would have been no great miracle that day had Elijah not repaired the altar. Oh, there's a great, deep, spiritual nugget in that. 
for each one of us. Losing our anointing is as simple as this. It's as simple as this. It's as simple as breaking a promise to God that we made. No matter how long ago it was. We can lose our anointing over that. Have you made a promise to God that you haven't kept? Pray about it this week. Pray about it. That means the altar needs repairing. Have you said something to him and not honoured it? That means the altar's been broken. There's a miracle coming when the altar's broken. Mm. It's as simple as ignoring a need the Lord has placed on my life. When he told me to go and give my neighbour something and I ignored him. The altar's been broken. Because I haven't heard the word of the Lord. Losing our anointing is simple. It's as simple as this, spending our Saturdays watching sport when we didn't even give a tithe of our time to God. Samson lost his anointing because he broke a promise to God. Mm. And remember the story of Samson. He cries out to God and he said, God, just one more chance. He's lost his eyesight. He can't see. Can you imagine? You can't. This is a problem with the church. He can't see spiritually. He's lost his eyesight. We need to cry out to God just one more chance. God, Amen. just one more time. Amen. One more time. Give me the anointing one more time. Mm. And I will obey you. Mm. One more chance. Father, I thank you for this word. You get me? May it stir our hearts, Lord. Lord, I pray that there be no sleep here until we repair the altars. Mm. Lord, don't let us just throw this down as another message. Let us receive this as a word from heaven. I pray that you will stir our hearts and show us if the altar needs repairing so the miracle can happen in our life. Mm. Open our eyes again, Lord, to what you see. All that we may see, like Jesus, when he saw the crowd, he said, move with compassion. When he saw the needs of the people, that it just broke him inside. Give us that anguish, Lord. Yes. Give us that passion and compassion for people. Lord, that we would not rest until salvation happens in their life. I pray for our families, Lord. I ask speedily that you bring them into your kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yes. Let the angels of the living God go forth and draw them. Mm -hmm. Let man go, Lord. You said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he send out a labor. Lord, sometimes they won't listen to us. But mm -hmm. you can send somebody. We know that and we pray it. We declare salvation over our families this day. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord, let this week, let our light shine. Let us not hide it under a bushel. Let our light shine. Let us be proud of the gospel yes. of salvation and not ashamed of it. In Jesus' name, we give you all the glory 